That's the reason I'm there every Sunday is to hear. But God's telling me from Him because I know what He is teaching us is from God. I came from a Christian family and we went to church all the time and I thought everybody in town thought we were strict. You know, no dancing, no nothing, you know. <laughs> Tracy Irwin, he came in one evening and he said, my mama said to invite y'all to church. And I said, what church did you go to? And I was Baptist and he said, Second Baptist. And I said, where is that? <laughs> so he told me. So that next Sunday, Kimberly and I went to church, and that's how we got actually got started. The people were so friendly and and uh, helpful, and just sort of took us under their wing, and that was it. We were hooked on it. I didn't go to church. I didn't. I, I didn't want to. And uh, I didn't come to church very much for a while. I was a Christian. I was a Sunday Christian, most of them. All week, I would live my life. Then Sunday, I would live God's life. But it wasn't a life really directed by God. I had heard him preaching and preaching, and when I got hearing him, I finally really give my life to God. I believe in Jesus Christ and know that He died on the cross for me. You know, I was really glad when we could see it on the TV and that was good and we enjoyed the lessons, but not being with other people and I really missed that. I really did. It's easy to stay home yeah. and, and uh, don't have to get up and get dressed and get out in the cold and all that, but you just, you miss people. You miss, I don't know, there's something about being there. It's just better, so much better. I know that uh, going and hearing the preacher to preach how to live according to God's will. That's the main thing.
Well, as always, it's just good to be in the house of the Lord. And I don't know how you are joining us, but isn't God a lot of fun to just help us to uh, see how things are going to be uh, handed to us? We've uh, stepped up the game a little bit with some of the live stream and other things, and we're grateful for that. I just want to add to our announcements of the I Love My Church emphasis that we are um, having, and whether you've heard about this or not, you, you do need to know that this month we are having I Love My Church month, and we have an emphasis that is throughout uh, the, the uh, month that says I Love My Church by praying, by attending, uh, by giving, by witnessing, and we're going to certainly emphasize those. And, and uh, today we're going to uh, be speaking towards uh, the, and preaching towards uh, attendance. And you would think, wow, why would you do that, preacher, with uh, you know, a snowstorm? And I bet it was hard for people to get there and all those kinds of things. Um, but we have the ability to go on. But one of the things I want to emphasize before we get into the message is um, uh, a commitment. We are doing a commitment card, and it says, I love my church, and it's in February. And what we really want to be able to do is to ask you to make this kind of a commitment, because on this card, it's very simple that if you would make the commitment to um, uh, a certain amount, what we're doing is, is in our media, uh, you might can tell that there are some improvements that we need to make. We've already made some of those, but we would like to put a package together that would allow us to do some things, everything from cameras to uh, some editing equipment and screens and things that would just enhance our message to um, uh, Ponca City. And we need about $12,000 to do that. You say, Pastor, you didn't even stutter when you said that. $12,000 isn't a whole lot of money these days. You know that, I know that, uh, especially when you're thinking about uh, other things to do, but in, um, in your house and other projects that you may have. But if we get together on some things, then uh, we realize that we need to put some effort into this. We'd like to uh, offer to say that we're gonna help promote this uh, through the cards, allowing you to maybe sign up to do some commitments between now and uh, May. And if you want to do that month by month, week by week, it really doesn't matter how we do that. If you want to just uh, write a check for all the $12,000 and send it to the church, uh, we'll, we'll suspend the whole thing right now and we'll just get busy. Um, I, you know, how God wants to do it through his people is really uh, up to him, isn't it? So we're going to make those particular uh, pleas and ask that you would uh, commit and that we're going to take this offering not just during February but through March and April and May because we understand that some people um, may uh, take a little longer. We also know that in our finance stewards who, who are promoting this, they're the ones that came up with the idea, they, uh, they want to see where we might be if we were just properly challenged and we go through the month of May. So that's what is going on. Well, this morning, I would like for you to take your Bible and turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Um, when we talk about attendance or church attendance, there's a couple of things that I think in way of introduction that you need to begin to think with me concerning this idea of attendance. The first thing is the church. Who, what is the church? If I go to a, a Greek lexicon and I begin to think about this, the word church that we um, translate from is ekklesia. And you've probably heard that, the ecclesia, the called out ones, is what we would be, and what a great and glorious name that is. The ones that are called out from the world into the presence of Christ, that is the church. It's a meeting, it's especially a religious congregation, a Christian community of its members here on earth. The assembly, the church, that is who we are. And so when we begin to think in terms of church and church attendance, we, our minds quickly go to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. In fact, when I was thinking through this, I was trying to exegete and get some things and ideas from this particular scripture. 
But then I began to realize as I studied that it's not just my mind that needs to be changed, but perhaps our approach to church attendance needs to be evaluated. The verse that I'm talking about is, and let us consider one another to provoke into love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Do the good works thing without stop attending church, is, is what uh, Paul is saying. But it's, it's what people have done. They get challenged to some things and they kind of back off a little bit. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day, and I would ask, what day? The day of the Lord's coming approaching. We're getting closer and closer, and there needs to be more involvement, not less. And that's what Paul is exhorting these people here, the Hebrews uh, that he is exhorting to uh, say that this is the sufficiency of Christ, and that's what's going on. Now, except for this passage, this one right here that I just read in Hebrews, attendance to church is assumed or expected. Everywhere else, nobody says, thou shalt go to church. There's not the kind of um, uh, admonition uh, like flee youthful lust or uh, telling us to love one another or how to behave or what kinds of uh, sin lists are there that we need to be concerned about if people continue in those particular sins like it is in the book of Romans. There, we don't have uh, doctrinal issues where it's included in things like uh, uh, in Ephesians, being filled with the Spirit. One of the proofs is that you're there. No, in, in the reality, attendance is either assumed or expected when we look at other passages throughout the Word of God. When someone addressed the church, they wrote a letter to the church, you think about it. Uh, there was an every anticipation that the congregation is just going to be present. They're going to be there for the meeting. When the book of Galatians is going to be read for the first time from Paul, it's assumed that the people of Galatia are going to be present. Or likewise, the people at the, the church at Ephesus or the, at Philippi. Those people were just expected that if Paul were writing that, that at one of their congregational meetings, the whole church would be there and hear what was being said. We don't have that quite same attitude today whenever it comes to church attendance. And even though we don't find much admonition for people to attend, we do find ample reasons for us to be present in the church meetings. And those reasons remain the same because they're scripture and they're going to be true yesterday, today, and forever. So why does the congregation gather? What happens when the congregation is together? Is there something about attendance that would be missing in our lives if we weren't here? And I think those reasons are made clear in our chosen passage today. So if you would, take a Bible. If you haven't already, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Now you can't get hardly any earlier in church history than Acts chapter 2. I know the church was founded, found, I know the church was founded on Jesus Christ back in the Gospels just a little bit earlier, but I also know that the experience, the history, the people just gathering together, needing to know the next steps was taking place right here in the book of Acts. So if you will, let's read together beginning in verse 37 and we'll finish this chapter. Acts chapter 2 verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. 
Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. First sermon of Peter, what was taking place? You have believers, you have new converts, and what is taking place? Look at verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and with breaking of bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added into the church daily such as should be saved. I think God's got something to talk to us about to give us the reasons why we should be faithful in our attendance. They are no different than what we have seen demonstrated by the people that were faithful in the first century church. Let's ask God to speak to our hearts and to repair those things and to encourage us where we need to be encouraged. Father, in Jesus' name, I'm asking that you would help me today to be able to communicate Lord, what you have spoken to my heart concerning attendance at church. Lord, we could say something about Second Baptist Church. We could say something about any meeting. We could be critical. The real thing is, Lord, it's not a matter of us motivating people out of guilt, but we need to have a reason to serve you. And Lord, I think we can find them this morning. Would you help me to find those reasons? And would you express them clearly uh, through your word, through this messenger, and that, Lord, we might somehow come to understand your purpose for all of our lives, for it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Reasons. We're going to find five of them, and um, I want you, if you want to just take a list or you want to see what they are, let's just begin here by prefacing all these things. I attend church because... Now, if we were just taking that in a personal testimony, there could be a lot of things that we would say, I like the music because I'm going to see my friends, because uh, I think it's the right thing to do. But if we go to Scripture, there are some things here I think we're going to find that will allow us to define the expectation and just the supposition, the assumption that we're just going to be here. And here, here they are, because these are, these are timeless in all of their measure. The first thing, I attend church because it's a catalyst for evangelism. If we go back and we, we extract what was taking place here, Peter had preached. He had come to the day of Pentecost and preached a sermon about what had taken place and how the gospel had come through Jesus Christ and through all the prophets before him. And there was a fulfillment of him being the Messiah, the Savior of the world. At the end of that message, 3,000 people are saved. The gathering of those people at that particular time in a common belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, it wasn't that they were just evangelized. It was just that that was the catalyst for evangelism. The message of evangelism was given to the church right here, and we begin to understand it in verse 38. One of the last things that Jesus says is that you go into the world and teach all people everywhere whatsoever I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And lo, I am with you always. It's a, what we call a commission. A great commission is what that is called. So what was that message that was entrusted to these, this group of believers? Well, Peter tells us, he says, repent. And what he then followed through with a testimony of baptism. If you have been saved, then you need to give a testimony of the death, burial, and resurrection in your life, what God has done for you, so that you can walk in the newness with him, according to Romans 6. Then you live according to the direction of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you didn't catch all of that, read verse 38 again. Peter said unto them, Repent. 
Be baptized, there's your testimony, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We're gonna get, a, we're gonna get the gift of the Holy Ghost so we have direction. The testimony of people at church encourage the lost to trust Christ as well. Look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. You know, there's one thing that I've noticed in my short time on this earth and in my, my very vague experiences. There's one thing I've noticed. When you are in church and people are being saved, the congregation gets happy. I've seen it over and over and over again. I've seen it in multiple congregations that the Lord has given me the privilege to be a part of or to experience this very thing. People walk the aisle, they get saved. You don't even have to know who they are. You don't have to know their past. You don't even really care about their age. But when someone trusts Christ, just like you have, you get happy in your spirit. Is that an amen? Of course it is. So it says, the, that phrase that comes up, it was added unto them. Now, there is an implication here. You add to something that is already there. So it indicates there's a presence. People don't get, get excited about people walking the aisle, getting saved and baptized if they're not here. But they were glad about what was taking place because it was added unto them. And it says also the same day. It means they were at, they were present at an event. Something was taking place on that particular day. This wasn't a process, not a lifestyle evangelism. This was taking place in real time with people in attendance. When you and I attend church, we should expect the gospel to be presented and for the lost to be saved. You ought to be able to know that if you were to bring a visitor that they are going to see other people that have been saved and hear a clear presentation of the gospel and have the opportunity to get excited about the things of God in the presence of God because the presence of God's people are here. That ought to be the case. But another reason that I attend church is it is the place I become founded in the Bible, the Word of God. It's how I know what the contents are of this book and how that, what they mean to my personal life, in my growth. Now you might say, well, I can read my Bible at home. You can, and I have no special anointing to interpret this except for the fact of God's calling and my responsibility to expound the Word of God. But we have teachers, we have good resources, and the place for that to, for us to agree, like the Bereans, on the interpretation of this word is in church. Church is not only for the lost, but it's to remember our definition of who the church is, the ecclesia, the called out. You see, lost people that are saved become a part of the church. So, this teaching of doctrine is for everyone that's been saved, no matter when they've been saved. I want you to keep something else in mind. If you have newly saved people, are they at the same grade level, if you will, as someone that's maybe been saved for 40 years? Now, unfortunately, in Christianity, they really could be because not everybody absorbs or gets it or has been faithful to, in, to uh, internalize the Word of God. But we're supposed to. And so they are supposed to receive this doctrine. And doctrine simply means to instruct or it means teaching. No one knows everything there is to know about the Bible. No one ever has except the Lord and he was the word. So I need to be taught. I need to go to conferences. You need to be in special Bible teaching time. We need this time together even this morning. And just like a good student, I need to be present to receive the instruction. Um, you don't really, I've had the privilege to teach in some, in some uh, places and uh, in different organizations and I would be assigned students and they would supposed to be at certain times and I'd get a schedule, I would be there and occasionally you have a person that doesn't show up for class. 
And then it comes to a final, or for a grade at the end, and they're expected to be able to perform or be able to tell you what the accumulation of the class has been for the time that they were required to be there. And I will just tell you, there's been a few times when the grades reflected their lack of involvement. They didn't get the doctrine. And there are times when Christian people that are called into account by their lives, by their experience, and something that God has wanted to put into their lives so that they would have an influence, and when they are called in on the final, they fail. You see, there's an expectation for us to know what the Bible says about the situations we're going to be in. You can't know it all. We need to be taught, and we need to be there to receive the instruction. I attend church because it's the place that I become founded in the Word of God. There's a third reason that I attend church, and it's because it fulfills my need for godly fellowship. Let me draw your attention back to verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread. And then skip down to verse 46. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, the breaking of bread from house to house, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now, Baptists really like this word fellowship because we tend, when we say fellowship, we tend to associate the word fellowship with food. Now, I'm not against food. But I do want to clarify what the word fellowship is about. Because God himself said, it is not good for man to be alone. I know the context of that in the creation. But the real fact is, is God even walked with man in the garden. We are, it's, it's abnormal. It's destructive for people to be isolated. We are meant to fellowship. It's strange for people to be loners. Now, I'm not talking about people that have outward personalities versus people that are shy. I'm not talking about that. You can come into a crowd of people and never say a word and have a good time. Not, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about people that are extrovert and always want to be heard or they laugh loud or something and that those are the godly people. That has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. So don't misinterpret this. The fellowship here is not about another meal or just a Baptist party. It's primarily about the main thing we have in common our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. When we fellowship, we've not gathered to do something. We've gathered because we are something. We are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we, when we are together, our, our spirits bear witness with one another. We are in fellowship. We are agreeing that Christ has preeminence and he is the one that we are that we fellowship around. He is the one that brings us to the right attitudes about himself. That is what fellowship is about. Philippians 1, verses 3 through 5, they speak to this. Philippians 1, verses 3 through 5. I thank my God, Paul says, upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you are all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, Paul's writing a letter. He's writing a letter. They're reading a letter, and so that means that he is not physically present, but he fellowships with them around the fact that they all love Jesus. But I'm telling you, when I get together with God's people, I sense it even more. I understand that we have all the peace, all the joy. We begin to pray for one another. We encourage one another. We do that in the person of Jesus Christ. And as we do that, it fulfills my need for godly fellowship. Well, so far, we go to church because it's where the gospel's presented. It's also the place that we have become founded in the Bible. It's the place where we can experience godly fellowship. But as we continue on in our passage, we begin to see that we can attend church because I know others are praying for me and I can pray for them. How many times throughout the epistles in the Word of God 
Do we understand that Paul would be saying that he was praying for a church or he would admonish them to pray without ceasing or he would say something simply, just pray always. And then he says, I make mention of you always in my prayers. He encourages us to be effectual and fervent, doesn't he? You see, the truth is, is we sometimes pray more when we pray together. I, I'm, I'm not sure what your personal experience is, but when somebody says, let's pray, um, do I catch myself sometimes thinking, whoa, I haven't prayed as much this week as I thought? Or we'll start mentioning prayer requests and we're thinking, I want people to pray for the needs in my life or a loved one's life. We raise our hands and appropriately we speak those prayer requests. You see, being together in attendance allows us a freedom because we expect to pray when we're at church. And sometimes when we don't come together, unfortunately, maybe we don't pray as often as we think. Sometimes we say, oh, I talk to God all the time. But if you put a stopwatch on it, in an average, most people pray about three minutes a week. Now, that seems, now, if you pray a lot more than that, you say, oh, well, I pray more than that. Just think how little other believers pray. Because if it comes out to an average, that, that becomes concerning. We just pray more sometimes when we're together. There, there's a time and a place and the distractions are minimized. So we get together and we know that prayer is going to happen. Church is the place where I become aware of the needs to pray for, and it's where I become aware of how the God that we pray to answers those prayers. We become increasingly conversant with the God that answers prayer. A believer's life without the supporting prayer of the church, that's just not normal. That's not right. You may not need anything in prayer today, but you do need to pray for someone in the church that does need prayer. You see, it's not about what I'm asking for. It's what the church is asking for. And in order to know what those needs are, we need to be present. And that's a reason. So I attend church because I need to pray. And finally, I attend church because... It's the best way for me to give to missions and to support the causes of Christ on a bigger scale. We look at verse 44 sometimes and we really come to a big misinterpretation and people want to get into politics or say something uh, that's really quite um, unnecessary about this verse. And it says, and, and all that believed were together had all things in common. I, I've heard people that tried to write dissertations and articles about this and use that as proof that Christianity should promote communism. Now, if you know anything about communism, you would understand that that's absurd. That's not anywhere close to what that means. And just because we give to a common cause does not mean that everything you own that you own belongs to me. I, I mentioned, uh, and we have before, different offerings. When we take a special offering or we take a collection here in the church and we receive it unto the Lord, that doesn't mean that I own everything else. I don't own your car, I don't own your house, and I, I certainly don't want to feed your dog. I'm just telling you, we don't. Ha when we say that we're having it common, we're bringing together a common offering for a common cause so that we can do that. And we're willing to share of those things so that we can even out the needs. In this particular church, there were some really needs within the body of Christ. And so some of the people gave more, and it did balance things out. But it didn't mean that everybody owned everybody else's stuff. But when it came into the common offering, we make the same decisions about that, and we do it together as a church, agreeing how that offering is to be used, how it's to be spent. So we give together so we can give more to the cause or the need, what God has led us to do as a church. I can't do that. I might spread my money out, but I'm telling you, if I can only give $5 to every need, that's one thing. But you see, if you give $5, I give $5, and 50 people get $5, 
you know, then what we're doing here is we're giving $250. And that seems to have a greater impact on what God has laid up on our hearts. So keep in mind that all this took place without social media, phones, transportation, all these things were going on. And they made an effort to continue daily, the Bible says, with one accord in the temple. They stayed in, the way they stayed in touch was in their attendance. They talked to one another. They trusted one another. They, they weren't just there for the gossip. Uh, Paul warned against that. What they began to do was they began to network in such a way that their attendance became vital to the cause of Jesus Christ. If we're going to do what Jesus told us to do in all of these areas, then we need to be in touch with one another, and we do that through attendance. You see, when I know the reasons to attend church, I don't need the admonitions or the reminders. I just attend because it's a catalyst for my evangelism. It gives me the get up and go to be able to say, I am going to be able to understand that there is a witness and I gather from that when I'm at church. I may not have gotten to lead that person to the Lord, but it gets me excited that people are coming to the Lord and I want to do that. I'm going to attend. I'm going to come. I'm going to learn those things. I'm going to learn how to witness. I'm going to attend those seminars. I'm going to be at visitation. So I can be excited and have all of these things uh, in common with these people that uh, are coming to the Lord. That's what I'm going to do. It's a place to become founded in the Bible. You know, we want to know how to live our lives, but the Bible teaches us how to do that. Um, we're going to um, have some time where we have different classes from time to time. It may be in finances or in parenting or how to have a better marriage. We may go to a conference somewhere. All of these things happen, but we want to go to places. If we take our youth to camp or something, we want what they are receiving to be from the Word of God. So we attend so that we will be better founded in the Word of God. One of the best places to be founded in the Word of God is the regular attendance and being under the preaching and the teaching that is offered regularly in a local New Testament, Bible-believing, fundamental church. Those are the things that we need to be aware of. It's a catalyst for evangelism. It's a place to become founded in the Bible. And it fulfills my need for godly fellowship. I need to occasionally just be around some people that think like I do. I need that. I need to know that there are people. I, I, I'll never forget uh, going into a, um, a, a conference and you feel alone. You think you're the um, only people that believe and act like you do and trying to raise your children right and, and you're trying to do some things. And we went to a conference several years as a family. And uh, every summer when we would walk in uh, to the Thompson Bowling Arena, over in Tennessee, we would just, we'd walk into there and 10,000 people. Now, they, they didn't all have the same personality. They didn't go to the same church we did. But we would go in and begin to sing. And there was such an encouragement because there was a single purpose of heart. We had great fellowship there. And I feel that way when I come to this church. There are people that love God the way I love God and challenge me to love God even more. It's a place for godly fellowship. And I need that. So I want to be faithful in my attendance. And then also I attend church because I know others are praying for me. I can pray for them. Prayer time should be a special time. I know people that uh, you start saying, well, let's divide up and let's pray. And about two minutes later, they're leaving and going out the door. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I didn't, couldn't even say the names that quick. Folks, it needs to be a reason, an assumption that we're going to draw closer to the Lord because there may be a day that I want someone else spending a little more time in prayer over my needs than what I just spent on their needs. And so it's the place where that takes place. And it's also the best way for me to give to missions, support the cause of Christ on a bigger scale. I want to be a part of something bigger than me. I don't want to just be, see what I can do for God. I want to be a part of something that says, this is what we do for God. That's the reason we have I Love My Church Month. That's the reason we emphasize different aspects of loving our church. But today, 
maybe we need to reevaluate the reasons that we attend. Is it because we're supposed to? But if we look at scripture here, there are benefits to my life if I become faithful. I would challenge you to test and try and prove the Lord God of hosts. And just say, you know, without fail, I am going to be in every service. I'm going to be in every opportunity to be there. And I would just ask you this morning, it's a real simple commitment. Would you just say, I am going to, without fail, I'm not going to make an excuse. I'm going to rearrange my schedule. But I want to see that if I go for 30 days, one month, and I don't miss any services, I don't miss any Sunday school, I don't miss a men's night, a ladies' night, I am not going to miss a prayer meeting, I'm, I'm going to be a part of everything that a church does, and I'm just going to see if there is not a benefit to my life. Would you put God to the test on that? And some of you that already do that, some of you already participate, would you be willing to share that benefit? We've had testimonies that have been on the videos this month, and what a blessing they are. But the benefits to people that are faithful, and you need to be able to say, you know, I wonder why their life is like that. And it would be well worth it if you would just commit this morning to say, for the next 30 days, I'm going to be faithful, God willing, and helping me. You know, I'm not talking about the weather. I'm not talking about health. I am talking about you not having a predisposed excuse to not come back because the reasons of the word are to be here, not to not be here. The admonition is not to, to get you to be here. The admonition is there's benefits when you are. And I'm just wondering what would happen if God's people would take God's word just at face value and attended for the reasons that God assumes is taking place in your life. If you're saved, you ought to be here. It's that simple. So as we come to a time of invitation, I wonder if quietly you would just bow your head. And you can do it there, but perhaps there would be more meaning if you would just come and kneel before the Lord and say, God, I'm going to take you up on the challenge. You don't have to voice it to me. The commitment's not to me. The commitment is to the head of the church, Christ. And if you would begin to just say, Lord, I'm only getting about one-eighth of everything that would be a benefit to my life, a reason for me to be here. And I'm going to step out, and I'm going to try you and see what all the reasons, what all the benefits, what you were expecting from me, I'm going to give that a month's trial so that I can say, God, you either failed me or you're blessing me. I can tell you from personal experience he's going to bless you. I can tell you that. I love my church. And so because I love my church, I'm attending church. Let's pray together. Father, we've stumbled, we've stammered, and we've made all kinds of uh, mistakes in the presentation this morning, but we want very, very much, Lord, to communicate that attendance is not something that we should be badgered into doing, that there are reasons for us to be faithful. Uh, we don't have to be convinced. We do it because we're people, we're God's people. It's like going to the table. We eat because we need the nourishment and it's not always just because we want to get something that tastes good or sometimes we just do it because we, it's necessary. It's like a drink of water on a hot day. And Lord, the necessity for attendance for a believer are found in these reasons. And Lord, I pray that you, if you've touched our heart in any way, that we would be challenged and that we would accept the challenge to be faithful to attendance, to see what you might do in our lives. If we wouldn't have the same kind of response that this first century church had, how we thank you, Lord, for their example. So as we purpose to do that, I just look forward to seeing our church grow, participate, and begin to exhibit what Christ is doing here in Ponca City. 
How we thank you for that. May your power descend upon us because of this one simple commitment. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. This is Pastor Ken Newport at Second Baptist Church. Once again, just thanking you for taking the time to view the message today. Messages from God's word always bring up questions, don't they? Some to the commitment, just like we've heard in the message today. Others are searching in our own souls about some things that maybe we're unsettled about. I found out that one of the questions that haunts us most of the time is, am I certain that I will go to heaven when I die? God's word is really clear about that. In fact, it tells us that these things have I written that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Let me just tell you what God's word says about eternal life. First of all, there's kind of an impossible situation. God says that only those that are perfect like him can enter in heaven. Revelation tells us that nothing that's abominable, anything that has blemish on it in any way, will be able to cohabitate in heaven with him. Now that sounds rather crass, it sounds rather limiting, but I would tell you that we wouldn't want a God that was anything less than perfection because we would wonder if he could really help us. But the truth is, we are helpless. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now, there's something that tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now we need an answer, but God has provided that. He says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What about this gift? God has says it is a gift. Who is that gift? What is that gift? John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There it is. That's the gift. His only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It comes down to this. I need to recognize that God is great. I'm not. He has provided for me a way for me to be with him through his perfect son, Jesus Christ. And by praying to receive Jesus Christ and repenting of my sin, coming to the end of myself, then I have the opportunity to spend eternity with him forever. In fact, it's even a guarantee. The Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. It's a gift that God has given to you. Now, I would just challenge you to just take a few quiet moments, review these things, maybe look on our website where I've printed out some of this information so that you can look it up in your own Bible and see exactly what God says. And then if you pray, I would love to know about that or any decision. Perhaps you're wanting to know about how to join a church or perhaps there's a situation of life that's a particular challenge and you want to know what God says about that. Check us out on our website and then let us know by contacting us there. The numbers are on the screen for our church and we want you to know that you can join us at any time in person. Would love to hear from you and meet you personally. Thank you for your time and God bless.